Today we conclude the uh, series that we're currently doing, the uh, Old Testament, the Law, the uh, Two Commandments that Jesus gave in the book of Matthew, the New Testament. Next week, Cassie and I will be gone. Uh, we'll be away for a few days, but I'm leaving you in uh, more than capable hands. Um, I think it was in the newsletter bulletin. If it wasn't, we'll be surprised. It'll be a surprise to some of the people doing it too, I think. Uh, upon entering seminary, I attended a two day orientation. And we were told that the goal of seminary, the purpose of seminary, was to tear down the current wall of theology that we had embedded within us and to rebuild that wall. At the end of our seminary journey, the wall might look exactly the same as it did when we entered. When we entered. Uh, for some of us, it may look completely different than it did when we entered. And for others of us, there may have been some intermixing there. But the idea was for us to come into seminary with an open mind, to be honest with ourselves, and to allow the teachings uh, of God and of Scripture to uh, move us and to fill us and to build us up. And that approach to seminary really fascinated me because it relaxed me. I didn't go to a Bible college. I went to a community college, then I went on to U of I, and then I went into seminary. Uh, but many of the students that were around me um, had attended a Bible college. And so they had a lot more biblical knowledge than I did. And that scared me. I was worried about that. But I soon realized that it didn't matter how much Joe over here knew or how much Sally over here knew, that when we got into seminary that our professors were going to treat us all as if we were starting from scratch. Because basically that's what they were doing. They were rebuilding our theology. In other words, we were all to become childlike in our faith. And a child's mind can absorb, it can be uh, impressionable. If you tell a child in Sunday school that Jesus walked on water, they're going to say, wow, I want to do that. I want to be like Jesus. If you tell an adult Sunday school that Jesus walked on water, they're going to go, what? When? Where? Prove it to me. And that's the difference between a childlike faith and a faith that questions, analyzes, criticizes everything. And it's no wonder that Jesus said the kingdom of heaven belonged to those who are like children because only those who are childlike in their faith can accept the awesomeness of the kingdom. It kind of reminds me of a line from the movie Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, the newest one, not the older one. They're in an elevator, the Wonkavator, and I think it was Mike TV, uh, one of the younger kids that had an attitude. Uh, they were going through a room, and all of these fireworks were going off. The Oompa Loompas were shooting off these fireworks, and they were exploding. And, and Mike TV says, uh, he says something like, why is everything here so pointless? To which the other child, I think it was Charlie, responds, candy doesn't have to have a point. That's why it's candy. Many times we're the ones asking, what's the point of all of this? Rather than just accepting that with God, anything and everything is possible. That if the streets of gold are, or the, the streets are lined with gold, okay. Jesus walked on water, okay. He healed? Okay. I'll take it. Jesus said it. Take it. Move on. Studies have shown that a child's first impression and often lasting impression about who God is comes from their parents. A child's perception of who God is, of his characteristics, of his ethics, of his morals, how he responds, the situations comes from their perception of the parents. 
who in their eyes is an extension of God. New York Times had an article that I came across. I'm going to paraphrase a little bit of it here. It read that when parents are more supportive of a child's autonomy, giving her a sense that she is in control of her own life, a child is more likely to see God as a more forgiving God. God is an authority figure to be respected, but not necessarily feared in the way of coming or approaching that authority figure. On the other hand, if parents are extremely, extremely strict and punishing, dictating every moment of a child's life, their children are more likely to believe that God is punishing, angry, powerful, power-hungry. Now, I'm not sharing this with you to teach you how to raise kids. I'm sharing this with you to show you that a child's understanding of God comes from, can come from what they see and what they hear from the parent. And this is what's been referred to as the father figure or the parental figure. And it's not something new. It's not something we only see today. And as we conclude our, our series on the Ten Commandments or on the laws, this is what I want to focus on, the parental figure. Earthly parents are intended to be examples of who God is, which is one of the reasons why the Bible refers to God as Father all throughout. Jesus teaches us in Matthew 5, Let your light shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father, your Father. He didn't say glorify my Father. Glorify your Father in heaven. The Lord's Prayer, our Father who art in heaven. And even Paul writes, The Spirit you received brought about your adoption into sonship, and by Him we cry, Father. The term Father has some embedded expectations already planted within it. The Jews knew this. The Gentiles knew this. We know it. Simply from the laws that were provided that outlined the responsibilities of the Father, there were already expectations planted in that title. According to the Torah, for example, parents must not sacrifice their children to a foreign god or to an idol. Now, for us today, we may think, well, we don't do that anymore, so that, that law, that rule, that's irrelevant for us. No sweat. Well, we may not sacrifice our children in the way of the ancient Jews, but parents do sacrifice their children to idols. Money, career, drugs, alcohol, infidelity. Anytime that a parent chooses something else over the well-being of their child, they are sacrificing that relationship, that moment with the child. Children watch this behavior. Parents who simply bring their children to Sunday school, drop them off, send them with friends. It's all right if you go to Sunday school. Just text me when you're done. I'll come pick you up. The church. Or parents who get up and the child's child says, are we going to go to church today? And the parents say, eh, I don't know. You know. I think we'll just stay home and what? Children are going to remember that. And when they get to a point where they have to make decisions on their own, they're going to go, well, you know, my dad, my dad did it, so that means it's okay for me to do it. I can do it too. He skipped church. I can skip church. Parents are responsible, according to the Torah, for teaching their children the law of God. Fathers will provide for their family. It's the responsibility for the father figure, for the parental figure to, to, to provide for their families, to make sure. A good example, I think, is 2 Kings. I want to read to you. This is Elisha. 2 Kings chapter 4. The wife of a man. The wife of a man. From the company of the prophets. Cried out to Elisha. So here we've got a man who was of the company of prophets. What does that tell us? That tells us that this man was learned, he was educated, he, he, he was taught by other prophets, by other 
people of God. And here is the wife of this man that came from the company of prophets. And this wife cries out to Elisha, Your servant, my husband, is dead. We don't know how he died, but we know he's passed on. My husband is dead, and you know that he revered the Lord, but now his creditor is coming to take my two boys as his slaves. What's that tell us? That tells us that this man did not have his things in order before he passed. That he didn't leave his wife or provide for his wife after his passing. We know that because he owes money so much so that they're going to come and take her two sons as slaves. And this is not what the Torah taught. The Torah taught that a man is to be responsible for his family, provide for his family. And I extend that. I, the parents need to be responsible providing for their children. <coughs> Fathers or parents. So these characteristics are connected to the parent or to the father. So when God is referred to as a father, the Jews would have automatically went, okay, God's our father. That means God's not going to just throw us away. He's not going to just sacrifice us. He's not going he, to teach us. He's going to show us the way. He's going to provide us that title of father or parental figure brought with it, expectations. And God fulfilled those expectations. Now, what does all this have to do with the law and, and all that? Moses. Moses was considered the father figure of Israel. He was God's representative. And if you read through the book of Exodus, you're going to see over and over and over again how the Israelites ran to Moses when they had problems. Ran to Moses when they needed food. They grumbled to Moses. They shouted heated words at Moses, much in the same way that a child might do to a parent today. Moses was God's representative. Moses led the people of Israel where God told him to lead the people of Israel. Every aspect of Moses' life reflected God. For 40 years, Moses led the Israelites through the wilderness, and for 40 years, Moses was their parental figure, their father figure. And then in Deuteronomy chapter 18, God makes Moses and the Israelites a promise. In Deuteronomy 18, 18, 19, he says, I will raise up for them a prophet like you, from among their fellow Israelites. And I will put my words in his mouth. He will tell them everything I command him. I myself will call to account anyone who does not listen to my words that the prophet speaks in my name. I will raise up a prophet like you, God says. Like who? Like Moses. He will lead Israel. He'll be the father figure for them, for all people. Who is God speaking of here? The Messiah. Jesus. John 1.21. Oh, I love John. I'm going to turn to this. John 1.21. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. John 1.21. I'm going to back up a little bit. I just have 1.21 here. All right, John, I'm going to start at 19. Now, this was John's testimony when the Jewish leaders in Jerusalem sent priests and Levites to ask him who he was. He did not fail to confess, but he confessed freely, I am not the Messiah. So they asked him, then who are you? Are you Elijah? He said, I am not. And uh, this is the verse right here. Are you the prophet? Are you the prophet? And he answers, no. Are you the prophet? What prophet? What prophet are they talking about? They're talking about the prophet God promised them back in Deuteronomy. Are you the one that, pro that God promised us? They would have known about it. They would have known the law. The Jews knew the law. The Jews knew the Torah. The Jews would have been familiar with it. They're taught this as children by their parents. They would have known this. But John wasn't, he wasn't the one. He wasn't the prophet. Who was the prophet? The prophet was the one whose sandals he wasn't worthy to tie. Jesus. Jesus. Just as Moses was the father figure of all of Israel, Jesus would become the father figure of all people. 
Colossians, Jesus is the invisible image of the invisible God. John 14, Jesus tells Philip, anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. Jesus is the Father figure. Now what does this tell us? This tells us that we are not God's adults, we are God's children. That we are to come to God with childlike faith, open minds, open hearts. Ready to listen, ready to move. And the way we do that is by viewing Jesus as our brother, but also as our father figure, our parental figure. Because Jesus was and Jesus is our example when it comes to living our lives. We are to follow his example, we are to follow his lead, we are to follow his direction in all that we do. We must allow Jesus to break down those theological walls that are embedded within us and allow him to rebuild us in his way. And when we do that, we grow closer to Him, we grow stronger to Him, we learn to rely on Him more, and we build up the body. Walk on water? Absolutely. You say it, Jesus, it happened. And Jesus only did what God led Him to do. John 8, 28 says, I do nothing on my own, but speak only what the Father has taught me. And in the same way, we are to Listen and teach what Jesus teaches us. So when Jesus says to love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, instead of saying that's impossible, there's no way anybody could ever do that, how do you even love with your soul anyway? Instead of saying that, we should be saying with a childlike faith, all right, we're going to do it. And then we look at Jesus and we see how Jesus loved with all his heart and all his mind and all his soul. What does it look like? Because Jesus shows us. And in the same way with the second command, love your neighbor as yourself. Well, I can't love Sam. I can't love Joe. I can't love Frank. I can't love Sally. How am I supposed to love someone who's different than me, who believes differently, who acts differently, who doesn't mesh with my standards? How do we love somebody like that? You look to your father figure. And you watch how our father figure loves people. All kinds of people from all walks of life. And then when you do that, when you look at how Jesus loves with all his mind, soul, and heart, and how he loves his, how he loves the neighbor, how he loves people, and you begin to walk like that, and you begin to talk like that, and you begin to act like that, before you even realize it, you're going to be living by the law. Not for salvation's sake. Because the law doesn't save you. Only Christ can save you. But you're going to be living by the law because Christ is the perfect law. And when you live like Him, living by those two great commands, the rest of the law begins to fall into place. When you love God and you love your neighbor, you're not going to want to hurt Him. You're not going to want to murder Him. You're not going to want to covet. You're not going to want to steal from Him. You're not going to want to do those things because you love them. Those laws will fall into place. Too often we allow human understanding to become a barrier between what Christ said and did and what human logic tells us is possible. God's grace defies human logic. And if you attempt to try to understand God with human logic, you're just going to mess yourself up. It doesn't make sense why God would love us in our filth, but He does. It doesn't make sense that God would send His only Son to die for a people that continually rejected Him and still reject Him today, but He did. It doesn't make sense that faith and faith alone saves us, but it does. All I have to do is believe? Yes. There's nothing else. Faith comes by hearing. You hear the Word and the faith within us is awakened. And that everything else is a manifestation of that faith. That faith leads us to love. That faith leads us to action. It's the faith within us. Childlike minds are impressionable and they absorb. We are God's children. We are to allow our Father figure to impress us. 
And so I invite you to reflect on those words that you've heard today in sermon and, and song and scripture. As we conclude this series today, our invitation is there something about that name, number 105, in your hymnals? They look like this. They're red and they've got pages in them. It's been a while. 105. There's something about that name. And because there is, He is our example. He is the one we are to be living like, speaking like, acting like. So this morning, let's stand. We'll sing through this one time. There's something about that name. And as we sing this this morning, let's sing it with some passion. Let's sing it like we really mean it. Let's allow God to touch our hearts. Something about that name.